will start because we have to go to the uh, actual symposium itself. Um, I'd like to first of all thank everybody who's here and particularly thank the Noor Foundation and the uh, United Nations, the NGO section of the United Nations as well as the University of Montreal for organizing this symposium and allowing us to um, introduce our uh, very exciting study, the AWARE study that I'll be talking about very briefly this morning. Um, as well as the Human Consciousness Project of the School of Medicine of the University of Southampton in the UK. Um, I'm going to start off by talking briefly about the AWARE study uh, and then lead on to talking about the Human Consciousness Project, uh, which is just being launched now, uh, as well as going on to talk about some of the studies that we have uh, in development uh, together with AWARE itself. Um, I am <coughs> uh, a fellow uh, at Weill Cornell Medical Center in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine, as well as a uh, Senior Research Fellow at the University of Southampton's uh, School of Medicine and uh, Division of Neuroscience. Um, I'd like to start off by giving a brief introduction to the study. Um, I think an area that most of us have been touched upon and have thought about at some point in our lives is what happens when we die. And although this has traditionally been perceived to be a subject for philosophy and theology, uh, recent advances in science have really allowed us the ability to conduct scientific research and to answer this, one of the biggest questions uh, for all of humankind through scientific and objective means. Now, from a medical point of view, we define death as no heartbeat, no uh, activity of the lungs, no breathing, and uh, a brain that is no longer functioning. And as you may have seen, in hospitals we typically will shine a light in the eyes and we look to see that there is no pupillary re response, there's no response from the eyes, which means that the brain stem and the brain itself has stopped functioning. And of course that makes sense because when the heart stops beating there's no blood flowing into the brain and all the organs and they cease functioning at that point, which is when we call somebody dead. However, although 50 or 100 years ago when somebody reached that point, there was very little chance that they could be brought back to life. Advances in science, and particularly resuscitation medicine, have allowed us to bring a proportion of people back to life, and therefore it allows us an understanding of what happens when people go through clinical death. A key point that I'd like to also raise at this point is that contrary to common perceptions, death is not a moment. Death is really a process that begins when we stop breathing, when the heart stops functioning and the brain shuts down. And in the initial phase, at least, it is potentially reversible. Because if you can imagine, when there is a lack of blood flow to the brain and all the other vital organs, that leads to numerous changes that take place in the cells, particularly in the brain, really within a very short period of time, within seconds, such that by a few minutes, five minutes or so, that leads to damage to the brain cells. And that process then continues along such that you get more and more damage, you get more and more permanent damage. And if you actually take this along further, obviously the body, the cells start to decompose over a few days. So there is a physiological process that takes place from the moment when the heart stops beating. Now, in the initial phase, which is variable, maybe just a few seconds, maybe minutes, tens of minutes, maybe even over an hour, there is a, a window of opportunity where we can bring the person back to life uh, if we can restore the heart. So. One of the most interesting questions that has come about from myself and many of our colleagues is what happens to the human mind and consciousness during death? So we know that death begins when the heart stops beating. However, at what point does the human mind and consciousness, which is really what matters, it is what we are, stop functioning? And we don't know the answer to that question. Is it simply immediately, as soon as the heart stops beating? Is it a few seconds afterwards? Is it a few minutes? Is it an hour or so? What happens to the human mind? And that is one of the biggest questions that uh, remains unanswered so far. Interestingly, um, research carried out in the last few years um, and published by numerous investigators, including uh, Professor Grayson, who's here, uh, and myself, and a number of other colleagues independently, have shown that 10 to 20 percent of people who've gone through clinical death and been brought back to life, paradoxically, report some activity of their mind and consciousness. So people will report thought processes, often lucid, well-structured thought processes with reasoning and memory formation. And although the majority of what they describe is very subjective, it's typical of the so-called near-death experience, there is a particular component to what people describe which is very objective. 
and that is that people describe the ability to see and hear what's happening uh, as they're being revived, as they're being resuscitated.